uh, back from our little break. And what we're going to do now is transition more. You know, we've looked at just uh, in, a, in a, uh, a definitional sense, what are the different types of government. Um, what we're going to look at now is how we kind of arrived at those different set, uh, types of government. We're going to look at the origins, and, and uh, as we look at the origins, we'll kind of be able to derive the purposes of government. Um, it's kind of an important exercise. If you look at um, the development of government in a pure sense, in other words, you know, uh, as, as governments first emerge, you can really see uh, why they developed, and, and we can begin to kind of think about what's the fundamental role of government, what, what things should it be doing at a minimum, and then what do we expect beyond that. Um, I really think it's an important kind of litmus test, because as I go through these different forms of government, uh, by kind of hopscotching through history, some will have a greater appeal to you than others. Um, and in that sense, you're also forming up your political identity. You know, when we talk about the federal system, you're going to have kind of a feeling, a gut feeling, as to what level of government governs best. And that will help define you politically. Similarly, as we talk about the role of those governments, whether it's federal, state, or local, you're going to have a gut feeling. And that will help define you up politically. Okay? So this is important um, for us to look at the, the, you know, the evolution, the development of government, because it helps us define out the, the proper scope of governmental power. Where you'd start, you know, as a political science major, is you look at those, you know, those early river civilizations. You'd start with river civilizations, um, because that's where we really see, um, uh, you know, more formal, uh, you know, si uh, systems of government beyond the families, the tribes, the clans, um, uh, you know, the small political units that existed at this point. We're living on a larger scale. Um, you know, we've settled on rivers because of all the things that rivers provide. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates and Mesopotamia and the first civilization there, Sumer. Um, we're talking about Egypt on the Nile. You know, we can go, um, we can actually go east and, and talk about uh, the, the Yang, Longchang and the Yangshu along the, uh, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, um, or the Harapan. And, um, uh, along the Indus River Valley. There's all these classic examples to look at. Um, and in each case, um, why did they develop? Well, as I began to have people come to rivers, because rivers are transportation and a source of food and irrigation and protection, and as my civilizations got bigger and bigger and bigger and living became more concentrated, it became more complicated. Um, you know, Right now, we've got a small uh, number of people. I watched, you know, you guys come in and navigate seats. And there wasn't any issue, you know. You, okay, there's plenty of seats and plenty of places for you guys to go. And you found where you were the most comfortable and you sat down. If this was a class of 200, then, you know, we begin to overlap on each other. And uh, scarce goods become uh, more of a commodity and something that we might begin to compete over. Um, so what happens is this collective living on a larger scale creates kind of tensions. Uh, you know, uh, people begin to, the rights of people begin to overlap, the uh, demands on resources begin to overlap. Um, and similarly, as we're living collectively, there's more wealth. And with more wealth, that's going to attract outside invaders, okay? So governments emerge to navigate this. Um, what they're doing is they're providing organization and protection. And that's about it. Um, you know, they're helping us live more efficiently, they're helping us live more safely. And because the role of government is simple, the theories that talk about who should be in power, who should be the central authority, are equally simple. There's the force theory, uh, where people accepted a ruler because they were the most powerful. They, they grabbed it by force, and that's what gave them authority. That's what made them legitimate. Remember, we talked about how important those concepts are. You can't really be a government unless people see you as legitimate. And in the earliest systems, what made a person legitimate is they were the strongest, most powerful individual. Um, as a kind of a, a counterbalance to that would be the natural development theory. What made the ruler legitimate is that they were seen as almost like a patriarch, a father figure. That it was a natural extension to the family unit. You know, from the family unit we went to clans, to tribes, and essentially there was a ruler that was the most wise, most capable, um, most uh, able, you know, not, not to say that they wouldn't use force, because if I carry out that, that paternal model, 
um, they could be a strict father, I suppose. But we just saw them as um, this, this um, leader that developed almost more organically as a result. Now, the, the other theory that you guys are familiar with, because this was the, the theory that justified the rule of absolute monarchs who had total power, is that this person is in charge because God selected them. This is the divine right theory. Right? God selected this person and their family. And it made them technically infallible um, because you know what they uh, wanted and what God wanted are supposed to be one and the same. But of course, if there was a war that they lost, if there was a famine or drought, it suggested that maybe uh, God was not with them. So this is kind of a tentative uh, theory to put all your, um, you know, put a lot of eggs in that basket. At any rate, um, what we see is, I think, the most, you know, what's the importance of looking at these early river civilizations? Well, I think it suggests what a government ought to be doing at its most basic. At the most basic, it's providing order and protection. And then the question for you is, do you want it to go beyond there? Again, you'll have a gut feeling as we kind of progress through it, because when we go to the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome, we do see uh, uh, an expanded uh, kind of approach to governing. In other words, what these governments did is they um, were the first ones to raise the kind of the question as to what's the role of the, of the citizen in government? Is government there just to provide order and security, or does government have a responsibility to serve as an outlet for people in terms of what they want. You know, Greece, obviously the first direct democracy, gave people a very, uh, in Athens more specifically, gave everybody a, uh, a voice in government. And by everybody, I mean citizens. Uh, whenever you look at Greece and Rome, we hold them up in high esteem, um, but they weren't purely democratic. Uh, in Greece, the average ratio of citizen to non-citizen was, or, or non-citizen to citizen was 10 to 1. For every one citizen, there were 10 slaves or people that couldn't vote because of gender or, or wealth or, you know, some other thing that put them on a lower status. Rome had its own uh, elite group as well. In the United States, it took us a long time to give everyone kind of an equal say, all right? So democracies don't get there overnight. Do kind of keep that in mind, but... They are, at least in both civilizations, the first to raise the question about what's the role of, of mankind um, in these systems. And then we lost these civilizations. You know, they're classical civilizations that we kept trying to come back to. Uh, marauding Germanic tribes brought down the, the, the Roman Empire. We go into this period of feudalism, where everybody gets small to stay alive. Power is divided. Um, that does lead us to think about... Um, it gives us a basis to claim that as a right in, in future models under feudalism. But um, you know what government is doing is based on blood ties and blood oaths. Um, there's not a lot of rights. There's not a lot of role of the, of the average citizen. Um, it's not even doing a very good job of providing order and protection when you think about this whole era. We've got you know 100 years war and 30 years war and wars of religion and uh, famines and plague and for this reason, we often uh, call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages, um, which is a bit of a misnomer. There was social and cultural development going on, but mostly it's the monks keeping that kind of stuff alive. At any rate, we have this kind of period where um, you know, government is maybe taking a backward step. And then we come into that era of absolutism, and we begin to transition towards the Enlightenment, if you remember studying those. And during those two time periods, um, we have social contract theorists. And, and again, I planted chips in your head as ninth graders. Hopefully, the social contract theorists come back to you, right? Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. You remember them? Social contract theorists. And they give us our next kind of quantum leap in terms of thinking about what government is and what makes it necessary. Now, what they all have in common is that they're social contract theorists. In other words, they look at government as a two-part equation. You know, everywhere else I wasn't looking at it as an equation. Government kind of um, emerged either through force or divine right, and it, you got what you got. Here, it's part of a, a, a consensus, right? The government is one party that enters into a contract. The people are the other part that enters into a contract. Both sides have obligations, and if the obligations aren't met, that contract is null and void. You hire someone to paint your house, they don't paint your house, you don't pay them. 
person painting your house, if they're not paid in timely installments and the check doesn't clear, they don't finish painting your house, okay? So that's what they have in common. Uh, they look at it as this binding agreement. Now, the degree of the consent and what each is consenting to differs um, from individual to individual. Um, and we're going to kind of go through them very quickly because, like I said, in the ninth grade, I already laid all the groundwork for this. And this is really considered foundational stuff. I don't necessarily... Locke, yes, you know, because of Locke's uh, relationship to Jefferson and the American experience. But, you know, Hobbes and Rousseau, they're important because they're part of any political scientist, any person that's studying government needs to know these guys because they provide um, a really strong background in thinking about what is government and why, you know, what should it do. All right? So let's start with Hobbes. Um, Hobbes writes a book called The Leviathan. I don't know if you remember that. Um, the, the, the book is really um, using the Leviathan as part of an analogy to try to sway people to bring back the king. Um, we've gone from the Tudors, we've gone from um, Elizabeth to the Stuarts. James, Charles, Charles, James, remember? Um, and what the Stuarts don't recognize is times have changed. Elizabeth is an absolute monarch, but she has to deal with Parliament. She has to deal with the Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights. Um, there are democratic institutions that limit her power, and she um, navigates that with a, a real dexterity. And it, as a result, she rules uh, very capably. In come the Stuarts, and they're ham-handed. They've got like big hams for hands, and they're knocking everything over. Um, they are... Uh, not understanding that times have changed, they're trying to rule as divine monarchs. Uh, Charles I gets into uh, you know, a continuation of an historic kind of uh, fight with Scotland over religious differences. And he's continually going to Parliament, which has gained the power of the purse, which doesn't sound that formidable. You know, power of the purse, your grandmother with a purse that's full of hard candy and coin. But imagine if she bashed you with that, right? What's the power of the purse? Well, you're going to find that legislation means nothing if there's not money behind it. It's just words on paper unless you've got a way to fund it. So Parliament has the power of the purse. It started as an advisory body. Now it's a legislative body. The king went to them often enough that he went from asking uh, advice to asking permission. And now they're a formidable body. And Charles wants them to raise taxes so that he can wage this religious war. They, they say no. It goes back and forth. He tries to disband them. Um, he finds he can't rule in their stead. Uh, they won't come back when he asks them to. Um, it devolves into a civil war. And this is the crazy thing. When you think about a civil war, you think of regions. What I'm having a uh, fight in this case is the legislative branch versus the executive branch, right? And the legislative branch actually wins. The legislative branch is led by Oliver Cromwell, who is an ultra-Puritan, uh, but one also with a, uh, a military background. Um, and he successfully de defeats the royalists, uh, puts the king on, on trial, executes the king, and in the process, the heavens don't open up, uh, lightning bolts don't rain down. He executes the king and the divine right of king theory, and England is ruled for a time as a commonwealth. But it's Cromwell, remember? Puritans. No drinking, no dancing, no playing cards, no showy dress, no profane language, no Christmas. You can have Christmas, but just don't celebrate it. Sit on a hard wooden bench and think about Jesus. Right? No tinsel, no wassailing, no, no Christmas trees. Um, he tries to get rid of the, the celebration of this. And as a result, he's reviled. Remember what they do after he dies? What do they do? They dig him up, they exhume him, they hang him before they did that, and to put his head in a pike, they have to decapitate him. So they hang him, decapitate him, put his head in a pike. All right? And England goes back as a result to the, to the Stuarts after this and back to constitutional monarchs. Now, in this setting, while England is transitioning to this commonwealth, Hobbes is writing the Leviathan, and he's saying, bring Charles back. Bring the kings back. Why? Well, first you need to understand that the Leviathan is this mythical, biblical sea monster, which is seemingly ferocious until you think about, um, you know, 
the blind use of power versus, I suppose, this uh, surgical use of power. He's going to make an argument that that mythical biblical sea monster kind of kept things in line. You know, picture, picture uh, Mr. Prescott, big cat. <laughs> Formidable, yet he keeps things in line, right? Um, that's kind of his analogy, that you need the king because the king gives certain things. Now, this is how he unravels his argument. He says, in order for you to, and this is an interesting exercise, in order for you to think about the purpose and origins of government, you need to think about what life is like without it. Hard to find it anywhere historically. You mostly have to do it in a fictional sense, but I want you to picture what life is like without government. To get you to picture that, I, I talked about as ninth graders, every adult authority kind of walking out of the building and, and marching out of Georgetown and leaving you to your own devices. And initially, there's big grins, right? You're thinking of the bonfire that you're going to have. Um, you're going to go raid Crosby's Market Basket. What is it now? You're going to have a big bonfire and cookout over at Kentucky Pond. Oh boy, right? You think of all the freedom that you have. And then there's a pit in your stomach as you think about all that freedom, what it invariably leads to. Hobbes talks about mankind living before there's government in this thing called the state of nature, where there is no higher authority. And if there is no higher authority, what it suggests is a basic equality between mankind. It, you know, I give you the example uh, that I used in the ninth grade. Let me put the most delicious uh, dessert you can imagine, a, a thick seven-layer chocolate cake with fudge frosting, um, and it's sitting right there. And there's no adult authority. Whose cake is it? It's a cake. There's no adult authority. You all want it. Whose is it, Liam? Anyone's, right? Is it just as much yours as it is Brian's? Yeah, why wouldn't it be? In the state of nature, with no higher authority, there's this basic equality. Now, Hobbes goes through, kind of in a, in a very painstaking way, all the things that we might say make us unequal. Like, well, isn't someone in this room stronger? You know, who's the strongest in this room? Well, he'll point out that, yeah, but can't the little people collude? Can't they jump on the big, strong person and drag them down like a, you know, a, 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 you know they're on some sort of National Geographic special and the wildebeest is getting dragged down? Well, isn't someone in this room smarter? And they'll point out, yeah, but what is intelligence but experience? And over time, everyone will be equal in terms of experience. He painstakingly goes step by step how we're all equal. And if we're all equal, then why don't we deserve things equally? Why don't we all have equal claim? All right? So equality leads to equal claim. And then the equality also says, well, there's no limits to what you can do to assert that claim. You know, you might say, hey, come on, guys, my chocolate cake, knock it off, right? When that doesn't work, what's to stop you from picking up a big stick? My chocolate cake, you all of a sudden get a little more, you know, assertive and start swinging that big stick, right? There's no limits as to how far we go in pursuing that equal claim. And what it means is total freedom is uh, a sham, an illusion, because total freedom actually equals no freedom. It equals anarchy. You know, my total freedom, I, I love musical expression. I love symbols. I used this example before. And I, I, for some reason, I want to follow Jen around and smash the symbols in her ear. I just want to walk around all day. It's my freedom of expression. And I'm going to bash symbols a quarter of a, a millimeter away from your ear. My freedom of self, musical self-expression overlaps on your freedom to be sane uh, and uh, uh, free of rage, right? Freedom start to overlap. So this is a puzzle box he puts you in. Because what happens as freedoms overlap is we devolve into anarchy. You know, Jenny says, I'm not going to participate in this nonsense. I'm going to be a pacifist. I'm going to go sit in the corner in the lotus position and meditate while you guys all bash each other in the head over chocolate cake. Hobbes will say, well, even that doesn't save her in the state of nature. Because I'm looking at her saying, what's she doing sitting over there in the lotus position? She's up to something. And then we bash. Right? People are senseless in the state of nature. They bash because it's glory. Look how strong I am. I bashed, I bashed that person real good. I'm the best, you know, basher in the room. Uh, they do it out of diffidence, which, he, which is insecurity. I don't know what she's up to. She's making me nervous. All right? We do it uh, out of, uh, you know, a sense of um, uh, competition. You know, to, just to see who's, you know, when you look at little kids, they just run to see who's the fastest. We're naturally competitive. We naturally want glory that comes from conquering. We're, we're naturally kind of insecure. So her, um, her effort to kind of stay separate isn't going to work. We're all in this mess. 
he summarizes it by saying life in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. Do you remember? It's actually poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, but the nasty, brutish, and short really stand out for people. People are not civilized. They're nasty. They use brute force. Um, and you don't live long. That's what they mean by short. This is a logic puzzle. No one wants to be here. And we're willing to trade away almost anything for security. Think about it uh, around the time of terrorist attacks. After 9-11, we passed the Patriot Act. Um, it involves um, a lot of new security procedures and protocols to address that threat. And people were uh, very, you know, they were okay with it. You were, everyone was okay with going to the, the airport and having a full body scan, um, having a kind of invasive, um, uh, you know, pat-downs and searches and, uh, through their, their personal goods um, for security. And then um, we're okay with like wiretapping and electronic monitoring and watch lists and things like that. And the further we get away from that event, that's when people begin to say, hey, wait a minute, we've lost too many civil liberties, all right? So this is a bit of a trap because we're willing to trade away all kinds of things for security. If you did not feel safe in those hallways, if every time you stepped up in those hallways, marauding gangs of sixth graders uh, colluded together and dragged you down and took your lunch money, would you welcome a more authoritative uh, uh, administration? Would you want Mr. Prescott, Big Cat, walking around the hallways with two baseball bats, you know, hitting people indiscriminately? Probably. Just, just for the visual alone, right? Um, we are willing to trade away all kinds of things for security. And therefore, it gets to his equation, all right? Because we're so desperate, this is what justifies the Leviathan, that monster, that absolute monarch. Because what you're willing to do is to give up what got us in trouble. And what got us in trouble is total freedom. I'm going to give up freedom. I'm going to give up my rights. And in exchange, I get protection. Can you think of your way out of that logic puzzle? Would you, would you be willing to give up anything and everything in exchange for protection? What good is anything else if you don't have life? He gets you trapped, all right? Locke is the one who thinks his way out of that, okay? Locke is the one that more directly influences the American political experience. When Hobbes wrote the Leviathan, he's writing to justify absolute monarchs when Locke is writing, it's later, we're in the Enlightenment, and he's writing more about constitutional monarchs. Monarchs with not total authority, with, who are limited by the rule of law, because he's figured out a way around the equation. What bugs him about Hobbes's theory is that people are giving up rights, and he looks at rights uniquely. He sees them as unalienable. The word alien is in there. An alien is somebody from somewhere else, right? You cannot be alienated, you cannot be sent somewhere else um, and, and divorced of your rights. They're yours, they're inherent. They're God-given, they're nature-given. You can think of it in any way, but they're part of a birthright. You're born with certain things that you're entitled to. And you couldn't give them up if you wanted to. It's part of your basic uh, uh, DNA to be entitled to certain things. All right. So this starts the formula. What does get us in trouble is uh, a limitless approach to those rights. You have freedom of speech, but do you have total freedom of speech? Anybody know the classic example of what you can't yell? We begin to use this as a way to define out where the rights of speech end. Yeah, like fire in a crowded movie. yeah you're not supposed to yell fire in a crowded movie theater. The, the Supreme Court used that language to let us know that your right to speech ends when it begins to overlap on someone's personal safety when it begins to lead to, they got a little more formal with it. They, they talked about it leading to imminent lawless action. I have to say something and then imminently, right away, it leads to chaos and, and people getting hurt. That's where my right to speech ends, okay? You have the right to uh, religion, but it's not a universal right. In other words, you can't begin to worship in public places in a manner that imposes your religion on others. You have freedom of uh, uh, religious expression, but the government is wary of also establishing religions. So there's limits, okay? And this is the, the, the formula that Locke figures out. You have freedoms, but there's limits to them. And if we recognize those limits, that's where security comes from. All right, major distinction. Hobbes says you give up freedoms. 
Locke says you simply agree to limit them. And in exchange, you get protection. That distinction people miss all the time. But it's a major distinction between giving up, not having a right in the first place, versus taking a more narrow definition of a right. We bring in Rousseau just because he's fun and he's crazy. Right? We bring him in as a contrast. He informs the French Revolution. And if you remember, the French Revolution was endless. Uh, seven different forms of government, and, and uh, none of them seem to kind of work. There's an idealism to Rousseau, and I think he is important um, because where Locke introduces the idea of unalienable rights and a limited government that's you know, limited by those rights and the rule of law, Rousseau is going to introduce to us the, the concept of popular sovereignty that we're kind of the source of power. He becomes a, a theorist that gives us claim to that. Um, where Rousseau starts is different. Everything about him is kind of different. He is a social contract theorist, but uh, in with Locke and Hobbes, the two parties to the contract were mankind and government. Here, the parties that are part of the contract is us, collectively. You know, think of the Mayflower Compact. People collectively entered into an agreement to create rules and abide by them. We, you know, in the Mayflower Compact, we brought government into existence. It, it wasn't there in the first place and part of the negotiation. And that's kind of what Rousseau starts with. He thinks about mankind in the state of nature very differently. For Locke and Hobbes, you know, the state of nature is the same. It's, it's solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It's awful. There's too many, you know, freedoms are too great and it leads to chaos. For Rousseau, he looks at it more like a, uh, a, nat you know, uh, a naturalist. Uh, the state of nature is just that, nature. Um, and pre-civilized man in that state of nature is pre-moral. You know, I joked about this as ninth graders. You wouldn't look, you know, as much as you don't want to, you know, you watch the nature film, the, the lion is about to drag down the gazelle, and my God, why doesn't the cameraman stop him? Do you ever think that? You save the gazelle. That lion is going, but you don't sit there and say, that's a bad lion. That lion should get a timeout. That's a, that's a mean lion. I'm going to scold him. Cinnamon, who are you to eat the gazelle, right? That's the natural order of things. You don't look at like, hey, zebras, I like them. Giraffes, I don't trust them. You don't attach morality to the natural world and their behaviors. Nor would you do it with mankind. Pre-civilized man is simply pre-moral. All right? What corrupts them? What creates the problem? Well, for Rousseau, it was the introduction of society. Because society creates mater uh, material and non-material things that we begin to compete over. Little green pieces of paper with you know, presidents and secretaries of the treasury all of a sudden become uh, something of value that we're willing to compete over. Ideas become commodities. I'm, I'm for uh, gun control. I'm against gun control. And we don't see any room for compromise. It's either uh, I win or you win. Right? Things, material things, ideas become commodities that we compete over. And that creates the awfulness. So, what's his contract about? What do we need to do to get out of it? Well, what he sees in the contract is um, through the people agreeing to form government and create this government, we're going to arrive at something he calls the general will. The general will. It's kind of code for democracy, but it really isn't. General will, what we all want. But what Rousseau, and what makes him so important, is he points out a fundamental flaw about government. That we often hold up democracy as a value, but democracy has been as abusive as any dictator ever there was. Right? You know, under our democratic system, we, uh, you know, slavery was an institution. The Japanese were interned in internment camps. The Native Americans were uh, driven to reservations. Um, and, you know, there's a life of poverty and destitution that, that kind of is still a legacy that follows from that. Um, we've invaded, uh, you know, countries in Central and South America and toppled democratic regimes um, for dictatorships that favor U.S. policies. I'm not trying to be a, you know, a, a, um, <laughs> I'm not trying to paint the United States as some sort of, you know, I'm a radical up here painting them in a certain way, but I think you can think of times where we've done things uh, in a democratic way that are objectionable. You with me? In my classic example, I had you vote. Remember, we had, to, we had a budget crisis, and we, we had to save money by uh, expelling students to the Galapagos. 
uh, with the, the heat, the, 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 there was dingoes, I believe, uh, 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 monitor lizards, and broken glass. And we're going to save money by, you couldn't stay in Georgetown because you might try to sneak back in the school system. So we're going to fly you to this island. And we're going to decide uh, who had to go. We didn't want to use race or gender or religion or ethnicity. We're going to use an arbitrary system of left-handed people versus right. But just out of curiosity, do I have any lefties in here? Who's right? Just the one, Kelly. All right, so Kelly, we're going to vote. We're going to kind of duplicate this again because I can't possibly, I only have certain resources for it, and we've got, to, we've got to expel somebody to the Galapagos once again. We're going to do it democratically. It's all democratic. How many are in favor of exporting the left-handed people? And I count, and there's seven hands. How many are in favor of ex exporting the right-handed people? One. And this bugged the heck out of you in the ninth grade, right? Because I asked you, was it democratic? Kelly, was it democratic? Yes. yes. Because what is democracy? Plain and simple. What's democracy? The rule of majority. Majority rule. And the majority in this case made an incredibly objectionable decision to export somebody based on a discriminatory kind of, you know, standard. The, all democracy is majority rule. That's the importance of Rousseau. He points that out. Now, his fix is kind of farcical, because what he's saying is, we're going to enter a social contract uh, where the legislative body is given power, and what they're going to arrive at is this general will. And it's democratic, but it's not democratic, because what it is, essentially, is um, not what we want, but what we need. He calls his democratic body the du at machine, which is uh, a French term for a literary device used in a Roman uh, place. You ever write yourself into a corner of a, uh, of a story and you just made it into a dream sequence and that way you go to the end and then I woke up. You know, where's my A, Mr. Goldberg? Where's my A, Mr. Murphy, right? Um, when the Romans got themselves in trouble, they literally had uh, a crane that had, um, uh, you know, a series of kind of cranks and levers and a rope and they lowered some, you know, sap into the play dressed as a god. And he would say, I'm a god, I fix everything. And then they'd ratchet him back up. He'd go back up. Right? The god would drop down into the play, fix everything, and then they'd end the play and send everybody home. Well, that's what the legislative branch is doing. Rousseau doesn't explain it. He says, you know, we just did something discriminatory, and the legislative branch will realize that what we, we want is to expel the left-handed people. What we need is left-handed sensitivity training. And we all have to kind of write with our left hand for a day and drag our hand through the ink and realize that scissors aren't set up for us. What else? What other, what other you know, frustrations does a lefty have? Ink all over your hands, you know, uh, and trying to find a left-handed glove, trying to find, you know, uh, uh, you know, things that, that, that uh, you know, fit your left-handed preference, right? We're all going to have to go a day where we have a buddy who's left-handed and we're going to follow them around and we'll have workshops and seminars and in the end we're going to have a parade. We wanted, we wanted to ex expel people, but we needed sensitivity training. That's what the Dewey machine does. Now, um, to kind of finalize, you know, really what he's introducing, though, in a farcical way, or a, a, a uh, overly ambitious way, is the idea that the people should be the source of power. What ought to appeal to you on some level is, did you like iteration one, two, or three? Do you believe that government, just at the most basic sense, uh, as Hobbes says, provides protection, and whatever that requires, it requires? Or do you believe that rights are kind of sacrosanct, and the line doesn't move? No matter what the threat to security is, your rights are your rights and we don't redefine them. Do you believe uh, the idea of uh, you know, the purity of democracy, but the need for a filter? That's really what his legislative body was. You have these impure kind of things that you want. It passes through the legislative branch, and the role of the legislative branch is to be a filter. They have to be kind of above us. They look neither to the left nor the right, but to the heavens. That's a Jefferson quote. And what it means is they know better than us and they're going to kind of use their expertise and their conscience to govern us. Somewhere in these theories, it's going to appeal to you. Now, give me like just a few more minutes. What we're going to begin to transition into, though, is the next jump. Because when we look at the modern era, um, governments do more than uh, just this, right? So tomorrow, what I want to run through is I want to look at the government's role in doing things above and beyond. And you've got to do a similar, do I think that's what they should do? Now, defense. 
All right, that one, that one uh, seems logical. But defense is just providing um, safety and security for you, right? Keeping your physical sense safe. Order is what allows you guys to live a more fulfilling life. You know, government might just provide defense and keep you kind of safe, but order means like I'm educating you. Um, there are rules of the roadway outside. So we'll go in more in depth with that, but these are separate concepts. Order is separate from rights, and we'll talk about civil liberties versus civil rights. Things that you're entitled to beyond uh, a basic kind of, you know, protection of life and, um, uh, you know, life in a, in a more kind of efficient, orderly, reasonable state. You have certain rights. From there, we're going to look at, um, we've got some numbers to look at, should governments provide services because they can do so more effectively? So not just rights, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about um, public transportation. We'll talk about public communication. We'll talk about libraries and museums and other things that um, schools provide. And then the last thing we'll look at is economic stability. What's the role of government to, pr uh, to provide you um, not just, um, you know, security, but should everyone be afforded the same level of economic opportunity? Or do we not just want a quality of opportunity, do we want a quality of outcome? Is it the government's role to make sure that everybody has a kind of a basic economic standard of living? All right? So we'll look at those six types tomorrow. Um, and I have a couple of things to say about economic models, but we might be wrapping up tomorrow if I can push you guys longer. All right? All right. Pause.